Okay, we, so we talked about we talked about thermistors so far. We talked about substituted values. I said the main the main bulk of this topic was pressure sensors, potentiometers, and thermistors, with supporting chapters being substituted values, the five volt reference circuit, and signal circuit integrity. So all of this is related in some way, shape, or form. We did the thermistors, we did the substituted values. Today I wanted to talk about the potentiometers and really the difference between these and thermistors and then also tie in the 5 volt reference circuit with these two. And we've done it before, we've, we did it with the case study we had in here with, with the bad computer, with the reverse polarity <laughs> jump start and the battery blew up and we covered that 5 volt reference circuit if you remember in that video and we really did some things in that video that we're going to talk about this morning. You know, we unplugged the thermistor to check for five volts. We didn't leave it plugged in. We unplugged it. Why did we unplug it? We verified no five volts by looking at another sensor. It happened to be, a, I think the map sensor is what we checked the five volt, or the TPS we checked the, the five volt on. We want to plug all this, this in and, and tie all these together today. So starting with potentiometers, section seven. Starting on page two, Throttle position sensor, this is our main focus with this chapter. What we're going to do with this TPS is we're going to focus on it primarily and then every other potentiometer will plug in the testing methods. Just like we did with thermistors where we focused primarily on the ECT and then we plugged in the other tests for all the other thermistors based off of the ECT testing procedure. We're going to do the same thing here. So starting with the description operation of the TPS, or you know what, I think I want to go in a little bit different order here. We'll come back to this. I, what I want to do first, just based off the introduction, is tie the two together and, and let you see where the thermistor differs from the potentiometer. And uh, to do that, let's go down to page six. And I know I've drawn some of these pictures for you guys before. But page six really shows a good example of what is different with the thermistor that we just covered compared to the potentiometer. And what you'll notice, first of all, is the 5 volt reference circuit is different from the signal. We actually have a separate 5 volt reference and a separate signal. If you remember with the thermistors, they were the same. The 5 volt reference circuit was the signal on a thermistor. What was different about it? If we were to extend this page, and I've done that in my 5 volt reference chapter, but I can show it to you here and what it would, would possibly look like. What we would do for the thermistor is we would take internally a leg off of this 5 volt reference, run it across a resistor internal to the computer, run it out to the thermistor, and then we would have our sensor ground here. So this is the this would be the thermistor circuit and notice that my 5 volt reference is coming from the same regulator. So let's be clear about this though. When it comes external, we're calling this the 5 volt ref, but it is also the signal. And the reason that we do that is this circuit is isolated by this resistor and we put our voltage sensing circuit here. So you see the difference in the design? We're still using the same 5 volt regulator, but it is isolated by a current limiting resistor. The thermistor is up here. This is your thermistor circuit. Okay, so the 5 volt reference is separate from the signal on a potentiometer. The 5 volt reference is the signal on a thermistor. The 5 volt reference on a potentiometer down here, this is our this is our potentiometer circuit. It doesn't matter if it's TPS, EGR valve position sensor, whatever wherever we put this potentiometer, it doesn't matter. They're all going to work the same way. The 5 volt reference is steady and never changes. It's always 5. Where the thermistor circuit, the 5 volt ref, at least on this side of it is designed to draw on the right side of this resistor here, it will stay 5 volts all the time. Okay? 
So let's look at this potentiometer down here. And what we see is we have a path for current to flow, and that is across a fixed resistor on its way to ground. And there's a term that maybe is the first time that I mentioned it. I'm not sure. And the term is signal return. Scott, you and I talked about this the other day. There was a question on a wiring diagram, and it looked like the signal return was the signal wire, and it is not. I believe it's on this expedition we have out here. Signal return is another name for a sensor ground. So you guys want to remember this for the test coming up, too. Signal return is another name for a sensor ground. I think primarily this is important when it comes to troubleshooting. You're looking at a wiring diagram, and you're not sure which one the signal wire is, and this signal return designation on a diagram will make you think that's the signal wire and it is not. There are other names for sensor grounds. Signal return is one. Another one would be reference low. So reference low would be another name for sensor ground. And I'm trying to think if there's a third. Well, I guess if you live in the UK, they call it Earth. No, you'll see, you'll see that designation. You, you will see that designation on some of the wiring diagrams we have over here when you're looking at some of the European cars. Okay, so the flow through this circuit is the five volt reference across a fixed resistor this way. And what we have occurring across the resistor is a voltage drop. So we we'll start up here at 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then down to 0. Of course, our ground being a little bit higher than 0, we're allowed less than 100 millivolts is the spec that we use for sensor grounds. You know, that ground wire itself will have some amount of resistance, so we're going to have some amount of voltage remaining in this circuit. But that's pretty much it. That's, that's the flow of the circuit. And you can think of this voltage sensing circuit as a voltmeter. This is your positive lead here. This is your negative lead. And what we're doing is we attach the end of this. It's a pointer that actually rides on the resistor. We attach this to the throttle shaft, and when, it, when you rotate the throttle, you are moving this wiper in different positions on that resistor. And so what we're providing is feedback back to the computer. If the wiper is up in this position, then we're going to read around 4 volts on this voltage sensing circuit. If it's down in this position, we're going to read around 1 volt. So as you open the throttle, voltage rises on a TPS in general. I say in general because on some of our drive-by wire systems, there will be two throttle position sensors. One starts low, one starts high, and they go opposite of each other. And I think I have a picture of that. Yep, right here, next page. This was actually off of a Ford drive-by wire system. That there are two potentiometers and you can see that in the red and blue traces up here that one is going high, the other is going low at the same time. And there is a little bit of a delay here, guys. This would, I am sure, be a manufacturer design in that the blue trace is reacting first before the red trace. There was nothing wrong with this car. That's just how they set it up. And if you ask me why, I would say for safety reasons, don't you think? If the computer's controlling the throttle plate all the time and your foot no longer is, your foot and your gas pedal now is an input to the computer. The computer controls the throttle plate. Don't you think it's important that the computer knows exactly where that throttle plate is all the time? And in case we have a failure on one of the potentiometer wipers that we have another circuit to back it up, I believe that's why you'll see at least two TPS signals on all the drive-by wire systems. It's a safety feature. I'm sure there's other reasons why. Maybe it's more precise control, whatever. But we will see that. It's really not difficult 
to do this. In fact, on this diagram, this is actually off of the same car. This is on a Ford. They're actually sharing the reference and sharing the ground between two of these. So if you look at if you look at the reference here, this would be our steady five all the time. And notice we're just supplying two different resistors. These would be in parallel to each other, not series. So we take that five volts and we run it across the resistor and then on this side we share grounds. So would I still have the same effect on these two where I would go five, four, three, two, one across both of these resistors. Can everybody understand that? And then we have that drop occurring. The difference would be what? Mechanically, one of these wipers would be in this position the same time the other one would be in this position. And as you rotate the throttle, this one moves this way and this one moves this way. So this one is decreasing and this one is increasing in voltage. That's all they've done. Yep, that's exactly right. And what you guys were looking at on that truck was the, the <clears throat> computer's monitoring of the two sensors where you said TPS agreement. And then the other thing that you guys were looking at, which we confirmed a dirty throttle plate, was the position of both of those sensors was around 20%. If you could have looked at voltage on them, you would have seen that they were both probably opposite of each other. Now, I'm not positive how GM does theirs. This is actually a Ford up here, but that's exactly right. And what's cool about this is as we continue and we learn about these potentiometers and how they work, these things are all over the car. Everywhere from climate control systems, where you have a, a selector, a blower selector that doesn't have specific positions, but has like a slide or a dial, that's a potentiometer. To your gas pedal on a drive-by-wire system is a potentiometer. Our electronic suspension systems will put potentiometers in each corner of the car on the strut, part of the strut, so we can measure position. That expedition that's out there has ride height sensors that are part of the air suspension system for loads in the back. It's a potentiometer. We have EGR valve position sensors that are potentiometers, throttle position sensors, it goes even further. Here's the cool thing. Once we finish this and we start talking about pressure sensors, electrically speaking, when we troubleshoot them, it's no different. Now, pressure sensors are more complex, and there's miniature circuitry in a pressure sensor, but when we, when we check them for wiring problems, when we check them for a signal, it is exactly the same as a potentiometer. So we are talking about a lot of different components on the car when we're talking about this one simple three-wire sensor circuit. And that's what I like about it. I think this is, this is one of those other subjects that just, it's just huge when you really take a step back and think about all the different circuitry you'll be able, you'll be able to check knowing this design. So variable signal, signal is separate from the reference. Thermistor, the reference is the signal. The reference drops. If we drop voltage on a potentiometer, we have a big problem because this reference circuit feeds a lot of other components in the system as well as internal to the computer. So let's do this right now. Let's, let's go to the reference chapter. And like I said, I, I did this with you guys when we had that car with the reverse polarity battery that exploded and the smoked engine computer. We talked about this, but maybe we went through a little bit fast. I'm not sure. I want to talk about it again here this morning. I drew a picture, generic picture of a 5-volt regulator. So we're looking up here. And what we have in dark red, in the bold red, what I have listed here is 5 volts all the time. So it doesn't change. Well, I say all the time, I, the key needs to be on. We need to power this computer up. And then we have this 5-volt regulator that becomes active all the time. And just like a voltage regulator on an alternator, this 5-volt regulator will sense loads and maintain 
5 volts. So let's say I unplug the TPS. I am eliminate, eliminating a current path right, to ground, so that would change current. Even though it's in the microamp range, if current changes, then we might have a voltage <coughs> rise or a pressure rise. The regulator accom accommodates that and maintains 5 volts all the time how you can unplug a sensor and it's still five even with it plugged in or unplugged because we have this regulator in place. So we take battery voltage 12 volts and it's not always 12 is it? We have 12 volts, 14 volts running, maybe four, maybe 14 and a half. Cranking maybe we have 10 and a half, 11. Regardless of that input our output will be a steady five. We don't want this five volt circuit changing while we're cranking would we? Would you want all of your sensors to change their signal when you crank the engine over? No. So we pick five because it's low enough to avoid system voltage changes having a factor in our inputs, and it's high enough to be used effectively, I guess I could say, by the engine computer system. It's pretty standard. I mean, this five volts is even used in your PlayStation controllers. You know, I remember I told you about that, right? My son's chewing on the wires to the controller, and my wife's panicking. I said, ah, it's okay, hon. It's only 5 volts. <laughs> Just because I'm curious and I want to know, and I checked it. In fact, the, the analog stick on, on the controller is a good example of a potentiometer. Your, anal your analog stick for your PlayStation controller or whatever you use, Xbox. It would be two opposing ones. They just... They do them, there'd be a resistor this way and a resistor this way, and you would have two areas that would ride as you move that analog stick. If you were, let's say you moved to the top right, you'd have one wiper that would move up here and the other would move here. If you went bottom left, it would be here and here, and then everywhere in between. You understand we're moving a combination of two, two different wipers. That's a little off subject there, but... Makes sense. Analog stick. So 12 volt feed gets dropped down to 5 volts and then again my red bold line here is 5 volts all the time. Notice that my TPS has that 5 volt ref circuit all the time. And it is shared in my picture with the map sensor and it is also shared with a component called a vein airflow meter. I just picked that one because it is a potentiometer. <clears throat> Most of our cars not most of our cars. There are no vein airflow sensors out there on today's cars. I think 95 is like the latest they use these. You'll still see them, but that's why I put that in there, just because it's another potentiometer. And then down here at the bottom, I'm showing the Hall Effect, which would be a crank sensor or cam sensor. This is pretty standard today, in particular on Chrysler's, where we will run this 5-volt reference circuit as the power up, if you want to call it, the feed to the Hall Effect crank and cam sensors, so they're, they're fed in there. Then I also have some thermistors, that's what an IAT, this is a thermistor, and this is a thermistor, that we're using the same reference circuit internally, but externally they are not the same, because we have resistors here. The resistors provide that necessary voltage drop. If you look at the top picture, I also have a switch input here, and I put that there just because some switch inputs use this 5 volt reference circuit too, and you can see that it is also isolated by a resistor. So this voltage can change out here on all of these, on this one, on this one, and on this one, without changing the reference on this side. It stays 5 all the time. That's really important, because if we lose that 5 to the right of these resistors, if this thing is dead, then down here, what I have listed as integrated circuits is just a very generic picture to tell you that this also feeds components inside of the computer. Okay, I'm not a, an electronic engineer and I don't know the internal workings of these integrated circuits, but memory chips and the microprocessor and everything is going to use this 5 volt reference circuit. And I've, I've compared this to like the bloodline of the human body. You know, this is the lifeblood of this engine computer system, this 5 volt reference circuit. Now if you think about it like that, 
you understand, I think, our approach with that car when it came in and didn't start. And we had no check engine light and we had no communication and our next thought was to check our blood pressure, right? I think we do that with a good, uh, you know, it, it's a pretty good analogy. You know, guy's laying on the ground, check his blood pressure. Is his heart still beating? It's a, like a critical first, first step in troubleshooting. Guy's hurting, he's laying on the ground. Has he got any blood pressure? Is he breathing? Car, same way. Turn the key on, no calm, no check engine light, no start. What's your first thought? Well, of course, check your fuses, whatever. But also, check the 5-volt reference circuit. It's probably faster than checking the fuses. And now that you see this picture, can you see that we can pick any one of these sensors on this list to do it? There is a variable, though. If you pick a thermistor to check your 5-volt reference, you need to understand that you have to unplug it to check for five because the thermistor will drop that five volt reference depending on the resistance. If we unplug it, we have eliminated the voltage drop across the internal resistor. You unplug this, you should read five in that location with it unplugged and only with it unplugged. So think back to our car, what did we do? We unplug the IAT sensor first, do you remember? Why did we choose the IAT sensor to unplug? Because it was right in front of our face. It was very easy to check. Key was on, unplug the IAT, check for five volts on one of the two wires. You might be thinking, well, which one? How did you know? Doesn't matter, check them both, right? You now know the operation of these circuits. Unplug the connector, check them both. We should have five volts on one of those two wires. If you don't have five volts on one of those two wires, like we didn't, are we definitely on the right track? Have we chosen the correct path? We have. Now from there, I want to suggest to you, in a normal circumstance, to go to the fuses next. If you don't believe me, I have a three-part series I want you to watch. And I have it hyperlinked in here. It's on page four. Watch these three for me. This was off of a Jeep. So it's part one, part two, and part three. It's Jeep No Start Case Study. I'm sorry, I should have put that title in there. You guys with the paper, you can't click on the paper, right? I tried it. It doesn't work very well. I tried it, and I guess that's it. In this video, what you will see is that ultimately we had a blown fuse. And what I truthfully thought, and the, way, the reason I shot it the way I did, I really thought going into it that we had a shorted 5-volt reference circuit. And I was very excited to finally show my first 5-volt reference circuit shorted case study. And it ended up being a blown, uh, it ended up being a main fuse to the computer that was blown. So if we go back to this page, if this fuse is blown, are we going to have 5 volts? No. And the only reason I'm telling you to pick that direction is just to save time. Because what we need to do when we have a shorted reference circuit is we need to isolate that short and that can take some time. And you'll see how I did that in this three-part series. So how surprised were you that you were wrong? I wasn't completely surprised. You talking about in this Jeep? Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't shocked. It was it was after going through after going through this that it still was a valuable video. Oh yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like all the steps. Here's here's the it's thing. It's just you know those moments where you're yeah. like, yeah, that's the problem. I'm gonna get this, and right. it's not that. Bad. No, but that's okay. Here's the thing with this video. Even though this one ended up being a blown fuse, the procedures I'm showing in this is exactly what you need to do when you have a shorted reference circuit. Now, I do have some more current ones with the five volt reference that I don't have hyperlinked in here yet and I need to. One was a, let me think of the title. Is it the Toyota Echo? Which one of you guys watched it? Shorted map sensor. Was it, the to was it a Toyota Echo? Well, you had that one uh, on the element, you remember? With that the, that's what it was. The, the Toyota Echo was, was a bad pressure. ground. It was a bad ground on the block. Okay. Yeah. Well, on that the, one video, I swear it was like a bad Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
I was on a Honda. I was on a Honda. Well, that's it. The kid kicked it when he was going up on the alignment rack. You know? And it, the thing is about that car is he had other symptoms. He had, like, stalling issues before, and he attributed that stall with what he had before. And what it was, he was pulling up on the alignment rack. He kicked the fuse out of the... <laughs> it was it, it was funny. You're right because it was in the video the whole time I'm filming, and I was doing it live. I didn't, you know what I mean? I didn't do it and then go back and film it. Uh, as I'm talking about this PGM FI main relay and doing checks on it, you can see the fuse on the floor. <laughs> That's what it was. The fuse. But it was. It, it, here's the thing. I still put it up there because all of the testing procedures for the PGM FI main relay. That's what you would need to do. And I accurately identified. Hey, wait a minute. We're missing a power feed to this relay <laughs> yeah we are there's the fuse laying on the floor <laughs> whatever uh, Honda element is is the one search Honda element on YouTube and it's the only Honda element I have up there if you just type in Honda element I believe it says no start case study that one has a shorted map sensor and that is a very very good video as far as identifying a reference circuit problem so let me let me back up to this picture and, and really discuss what we did in that video really in the Jeep video and the Honda element video oh, and there's one more too I, I did a case study and this one isn't exactly the whole procedure, but it is the beginning of the procedure. It was a Chevy Cavalier. It was a Chevy Cavalier, and it, again, it was a no start case study. I don't remember the exact title. On this one, we went to one of my garages. The car would not start, turned the key on, there was no check engine light, the scan tool would not communicate. Sound familiar? Yeah. Next step we did on that vehicle is we checked for 5 volt reference on one of the sensors and sure enough it was missing. In this video, the Chevy Cavalier video, I did not walk through the 5 volt reference circuit checks. I went to the fuses next. Why? Time. How easy is it to check the fuses? Sure enough we had a blown ECM fuse. Okay, So procedure still there we just didn't finish what I'm about to show you now which is how do we isolate the reference circuit so let's say your fuses are good or you chose not to go that path whatever it may be if you have no 5 volt reference the first thing you have to do is identify all the sensors that share that 5 volt reference can you see that my Hall effect down here it has an external 5 volt line that comes out and then my other 5 volt reference is here and then it looks externally like it has two separate 5 volt reference circuits. Like if you couldn't see the internals of this, if this is all blank like it is on our wiring diagrams, they don't draw the internals on most of them, doesn't it look like I have two reference circuits? Mm -hmm. Externally it looks like two, but guess what? It's just one. So the first thing that you need to understand is a short down here will affect the same circuit up here or vice versa. Okay? So when I say step one, find all of the circuits that share this reference, this is what you're doing. So we've identified four main components on our diagram, the TPS, the MAP, the VAF, and the Hall Effect camera crank that share this reference. Do I need to worry about my thermistors? In this process of checking for a shorted reference circuit, do I need to worry about my thermistors? Do I need to worry about my switch input? I don't need to worry about them. That is correct because they are isolated. These circuits are designed to be pulled to ground. The switch input in particular, it's a pull-down switch input. Notice on this diagram that I am sharing all of these grounds with all of these sensors. And I named it signal return right here. All the sensors are sharing this ground. So when my switch closes, isn't it 
effectively sorting out the signal circuit or the reference circuit, pulling it all the way to ground. It's supposed to. That's how, that's how it's designed to work. The thermistors are no different. The difference with the thermistors, though, is they just do it gradually, not immediately. So the top picture is on, on the switch is a digital signal, and on the thermistors, they're analog. They drop slowly. Point is, I can have a short anywhere in, in this or in this or the sensor itself, and it will not pull the 5-volt reference circuit to ground. Only that signal. If, however, the TPS shorts internally, can you see that that would pull this 5-volt reference to ground? And this regulator can only handle so much. The ones that you buy at Radio Shack, which, by the way, the catalog number is a 7805 5-volt regulator. You might be thinking, why would you know that? Well, I've fixed certain cars externally with a 5-volt regulator. The, the 7805s from Radio Shack can only ha handle one amp of current flow before they blow out. So if you give this a direct short to ground, I am confident that you would be drawing more than one amp. The thing about the engine computer, though, is they protect this regulator. And I'm not sure exactly how they do it, whether they use a PTC resistor or some type of current limiting device. If there's more draw on this than there should be, this circuit gets protected somehow after the regulator, so we don't burn the regulator up. How do I know that? Because I have fixed multiple 5-volt regulated circuits that were shorted to ground. As soon as I fix the short, 5 volts comes back. I have seen on Chrysler with a shorted regulator, there's some type of switching device. I know this because I had a crank sensor that I was reading 0.8 of a volt on on the 5 volt reference circuit that I accidentally touched to ground. It had 5 on it previous. And I, I remember which video it was on. It was on the Neon video. If you guys search Dodge Neon crank sensor, it had a wiring problem to the crank sensor. And the wiring was pretty butchered up if I remember. There were some bare wires back there and in the process of testing them I accidentally shorted this 5 volt reference to the ground wire and it went from 5 volts and it dropped to 0.8 on my meter. And even after I removed the short it stayed at 0.8 until I turned the key off and turned the key back on. So what's that tell me? Something in here actually switched and it wouldn't reset until I cycled the key and bring that 5 volts back. Is there, here's the point, is there some type of circuit protection going on with these 5 volt regulators? There is. I'm not saying that gives us free reign to just go ahead and jump <laughs> wires and, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I, I don't want you guys to think that. And, and as we continue, you'll see the safety that I've added to some of my previous tests, which is let's put a resistor in when we're doing this reference circuit to signal circuit jump, signal circuit integrity testing, which is coming up. So I've done that. Okay, so no reference is where we are. We have determined the sensors that are on the circuit. We are not worried about the thermistors. We're not worried about the switch input. Next thing we do, we start unplugging these. Let's say we have our meter connected here because it's easy to get to. Voltmeter, we're reading zero volts. Unplug the TPS. If it goes to five, what's the problem? TPS is short to ground. Now, in the case of that Chrysler that I just gave you guys, is there a, a time we may need to cycle the key off and back on when we're doing this? Yeah. It is possible. I saw it on that neon. I don't have that written in here. Just remember that. Okay, if it stays at zero, unplug the map. If it goes to five, what's the problem? Sorted map. Sorted map. What I would suggest you do as you're doing this, which is what we did in our car with the battery that blew up and fried the computer, 
Remember we left the sensors unplugged? Because what happens when you unplug all of these and it still stays at zero, you're pointing toward the computer now as the problem. Before you would replace the computer, of course, we check powers and, and grounds. But we would also want to disconnect the computer. Sensors are all disconnected, so this circuit's completely isolated now. now. These two, what I'm drawing as green wires, are isolated. Computer is unplugged. We would take our ohm meter now, go to ground, and touch on the reference wire. With it unplugged from the sensors and unplugged from the computer, what is the only acceptable reading is OL M ohms, right? Which is infinity. That's what infinity looks like on most of our meters. Although, don't leave your voltmeter connected. You remember that? We had a reading on that car. Mm -hmm. Why did we have a reading of 9.3 mega ohms? What we were doing with the ohm meter is we were sending out a small trace, that's what it does, and it was finding a path through the voltmeter, which was the scope still connected to that one sensor. And we were actually reading the internal impedance of that voltmeter portion of the scope. So that'd be your one tech, and then your next tech is down here. Because remember, anything shorted down here will also affect up here. In the Jeep video, you know what I did when I found that extra wire? I just cut it. And the reason I cut it is because there was a transmission pressure sensor, a governor pressure sensor that was underneath that I couldn't easily get to in the classroom because I would have had to unplug that first and then check the wire too. I cut it because it was easier to do a wiring repair up top than it was to crawl underneath, unplug that sensor, find the sensor, I'm not suggesting that you do that. Uh, there was just plenty of wire there. There was a lot of the loom and a lot of extra wire, you could say, that made a wiring repair very easy. So instead of ohming this circuit, I cut that wire and then monitored my voltage. And it still stayed at zero, so I knew this circuit wasn't shorted. But if, if you're not doing it that way, it would be sensors disconnected, computers disconnected, and again, ohm meter to ground, and then lead here. That's what we did in that car with the computer that blew up. All right, so sensors are unplugged, stays at zero. We're not worried about our thermistors, right? Those are not going to cause it. Can we use the thermistors as a guide, though, as a starting point? Unplug a thermistor, make sure we have five. We can use those as a guide, but they're not part of the process of finding the short. Zero, sensors all unplugged, ohm the wires. We see OL, M ohms on both of these. Now our direction goes toward the computer. And again, before you replace the computer, you better check your powers and grounds. That's what we did in the Jeep. And then I found in, on the Jeep a blown fuse. So you understand now that you may want to check the fuses first. Save you time. Chevy Cavalier saved us lots of time. Blown fuse. Yeah. However, in the Honda Element video and our, our blown uh, engine computer we had in here this term with the battery that exploded and on both of those cars, checking the fuses would lead you nowhere you would have to do the process that I showed on the Jeep, that I show on, the, in the, on those two cars. So some other truths over here to the left. Grounds can be shared between any input. Does everybody understand that? that our grounds, our sensor grounds can be shared. Now here's the thing about this. I like this part. This part will allow you guys to read wiring diagrams better. And I'll show you that here in, in two examples coming up. Grounds can be shared between any input. This will help you read a computer system diagram. Signal wires are never shared between sensors. This will also help. These truths that I'm listing here, again, are primarily for wiring diagram identification. Next bullet, 5 volt reference can be shared externally from the PCM with pots and pressure sensors 
and Hall effects, but never with thermistors. We discussed that. We cannot share the reference externally with a potentiometer and a thermistor. Can't be done. Internally, yes. Externally, no. These next two, a sorted, basically you're saying a sorted pressure sensor, potentiometer, Hall effect, will pull the whole reference circuit down, including the thermistor reference, but a sorted thermistor reference will not pull those other ones down. Here's another way we could state this. A sorted TPS will affect the ECT, true or false? True. True. A sorted ECT will affect the TPS. False. False. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's, let's put this into practice. I think we're good on this page. Page three just describes what we've been doing, what we've been talking about. Same thing on page four. We're talking about how to do the test. So you have this information later for you guys. Unplug the components, look for voltage. That's what we're doing here. The last two pages, this is uh, page five. Guys, don't look real quick. I want to, don't look at your book. I should have had this blank, uh, blacked out already. And the reason that I like to do this is because I, I want to plug these truths into this diagram so you guys can just focus on one little section of the diagram and be able to totally dissect it. Okay? So what we have is a TPS. This would be a potentiometer. This would be a Hall effect. This is a Hall effect. Hall effect. We have a thermistor over here. We have a pressure sensor over here. We have a thermistor here. So thinking about what can be shared, what can't be shared, is going to allow you to quickly isolate the diagram. I see shared points, that's the splice. So there's a splice here, and let's just kind of draw this one out for a second. And one of the things you never want to do when you're mapping diagrams is to, to draw through a component. We never want to draw through a component. Because if you do that, you're going to mess up in your mind polarity of that circuit. So we always stop when we come to a component, whether it be a sensor, a, a coil of wire, whatever, electric motor, you always stop. What we're seeing on this diagram is there is a lot of stuff that's using this wire. Did I miss one? Yep. So, basically, everything on this, the map, the coolant, air temp, throttle position, cam, crank, vehicle speed, and the heated O2 are all sharing this wire. What wire does that have to be? It can only be the ground or the signal return wire because we cannot share a reference with potentiometers, pressure sensors, and thermistors. Does, does that make sense? This is absolutely the ground wire, no question about it. So now that makes the next shared splice easy because we have one right here. Where does it go? It goes to the map and it goes to the TPS. What does that wire have to be? We never share signal wires. It can't be the signal wire. It's the 5 volt reference. On this year car, they actually used a 9 volt reference for the cam, the crank, and the vehicle speed. They no longer do that. So I'm going to modify this this is not here on a newer car, and this will actually uh, will splice over to this location, this location right here. So forget this. Just pretend that's not there. So what else shares this is the crank. And th this makes it a little bit more difficult when you do it this way as far as identification, but this is the reality on today's Chryslers. So you can see a lot of sensors now sharing that. The TPS, the crank, the cam, the vehicle speed, the map, but notice what's not on that. Our thermistors are not on that. So guess what? That's the identification to tell you that's the reference, not the ground wire or signal return wire. And then the rest of this is easy. Now we've identified our signal circuits, haven't we? There's your signal, there's your signal, here's your signal, signal, signal signal and signal. And you see we really didn't need help with that, did we? Just knowing these truths allowed our focus to, to 
be very narrow. I mean, we're really just looking at, at this part of the circuit right here, and we've identified references, grounds, and signals. Okay? One more. This is another practice piece, and I'll let you guys take a break. What do we have? Cam, crank, TPS, manifold, presser, oil presser, engine coolant, intake air, and we can see shared components. We see shared components. Where do you want to start? I don't know. Let's start with this black with a light blue wire. Ground. This wire right here. Ground. Yeah, as soon as I see this, I don't really need to look any further, do I? I see these two thermistors share it. Really, that in itself, I'm done. Just looking right here, right, told me what? That has to be the ground. We don't share references with thermistors. The reference is the signal. We never share signals between other sensors. So that's the ground. So everything else attached to this is also a ground. And that would be up here too, all of this. It's all, all a shared ground. <clears throat> what we see in the picture is some other shared wires. And that would be this one. Which wire is that? That's my 5 volt reference. And then that makes the rest of this pretty easy again. This is a signal, signal, signal. Now one of the things I want to point out to you guys too on Mitchell wiring diagrams, wherever the wiper is, that's your signal wire. So you can use your another clue to help you out there in dissecting these is where's the wiper? The wiper is the signal wire. Notice this oil pressure sensor has a different wire, this violet and black right here. This is your 5 volt reference. And then this right here is your signal. We know that by the wiper. I am sure on this circuit, even though it's a different 5 volt ref, it probably ties in somewhere into the computer for the orange wires over here. They do that sometimes. I'm not sure why. I'm not absolutely positive. It could be that that oil pressure sensor, that that violet and black is coming from the instrument cluster and it's on a different line completely. I'm not positive about that. The point with this was to identify circuitry very quickly. So any questions on the, on the identification before I let you guys break? Makes for reading these a little bit easier, doesn't it? Okay, do you guys understand the difference in potentiometers and thermistors? Because those are our two main ones we've talked about so far. And really what we've done here is we've also talked about pressure sensors without you guys even realizing it. Our pressure sensor circuits, look how I drew the map sensor. That is a pressure sensor. I drew it as a potentiometer, as it having a movable wiper. The nice thing about that, Mitchell does this, the nice thing about that is that's how we think of them when we troubleshoot them. They don't work that way, but to us, they do. So I'll let you guys break. When we come back from break, we'll, we'll attack the TPS and really how it's used in the engine management system, and then we'll continue through potentiometers and, and pressure sensors, and then we'll probably have, have our test days of today, Monday. We'll have our test probably Wednesday. I need one more day of this. All right, go take a break.